Wow, what an amazing intro. Of course, that was my notes from an artist co-host, David C. Gross, from his album, Theorcalus. Let me spell that for you since it is not a common word. T-H-E-O-R-C-O-L-U-S. I highly recommend Theorcalus if you dig Sun Ra, Electric Miles Davis, King Crimson, Frank Zapp, and of course if you dig David C. Gross, an acquired taste, but he is diggable. And you can hear Theorcalus on all the streaming platforms. In case you haven't guessed it, I am Tom Semioli, and I am defending the 1980s. Musically, that is, not politically. I feel the 1980s were a much maligned decade. I'm here to unmalign it, maybe realign it, maybe refine it. How's that? How's that for a little riffage there? Uh, this video series is based on my Know Your Bass Player op-ed, which opines that rock's greatest decade was the 1980s. And you can read it on the link below. I've included that in the YouTube descriptive. It is not generated by ChatGPT. It is generated by me. No artificial intelligence. Maybe some actual intelligence. So why am I qualified to do this? Well, I was a working musician in the 1980s, and there is my working musician bass, my beloved Steinberger XL, which I feel is the best bass ever, best electric bass, best mass-produced electric bass. Many bass players will disagree with me on that, but hey, it's my show. Get your own show, and then you can tell us what you think the best bass is. Uh, in addition to hosting notes from an artist on Cygnus Radio and podcast, uh, for several years, I was an extinguished rock journalist and publicist, and I worked in television for 20 years, but do not hold that against me. When it comes to rock journalism, uh, I have adhered to Frank Zappa's a credo. It's people who can't write interviewing, people who can't talk, for people who cannot read. Now, for all you 60s fans, you know I also like to quote Abby Hoffman, who said, sacred cows make the tastiest hamburgers. So our sacred cow hamburger today is the Kinks. You all know who the kinks are. I don't have to uh, go back in time and explain it. Uh, but like many of their British invasion peers, namely the Stones, the Who, and Eric Clapton, the Side 3, the kinks needed to retool their sound in the 1980s. And why not? Recording technology was advancing at a rapid pace. Records sounded better than ever. Guitars, basses, and keyboards vastly improved. Uh, drum mics ensured that every beat was heard on stage and in the studio, so it was a natural progression for these bands, including the Kinks, to upgrade their sound. But uh, actually, that transition actually started in 1978 when bassist Jim Rodford came aboard. Now, Jim had known the Kinks since the early 1960s as a member of the Mike Cotton Sound, which shared the bill with uh, the Kinks on many tours in the UK and Europe. In 2014, I interviewed the late, great Jim Rodford. Uh, he actually brought his Mustang bass out of storage for me, and that's the bass he used on the Kinks and Argent Records. Very very flattered that he did that uh, for us. Uh, we filmed uh, Jim in his hometown of St. Albans at the Horn, which was a uh, infamous rock club near his home. And Jim really tells us the story of the Kinks in the 1980s. It is the only filmed interview of Jim Rodford. He's a great character. Check it out. Uh, be sure to watch that interview series. I will include the link down below in the YouTube description. In our interview... Uh, Jim recalls it rising ready to get back to the Kinks roots, and that is featured Dave Davis's guitar more. Um, speaking of bass players, uh, in my humble opinion, I think Jim was the best bass, bassist uh, for the Kinks. Founding bassist Peter Quaif uh, really couldn't make the transition from the early to late 60s expectation of a bass player. I don't think he had the chops. He was musical, not saying that, but uh, I don't think really... You know, he, he developed enough to, to handle what was going on in the 70s and the 80s, especially as uh, recording technology improved. Um, John Dalton preceded Jim Rodford. He was the Kings bass player from 69 to 77, and he was good. He was okay. I think he started off as a guitar player, but um, there's nothing wrong with that, of course, but he played more like a guitar player plays bass. Rodford uh, anchored uh, progressive rock as Argent. And it was a far more articulate player with excellent rhythmic and harmonic skills. Uh, it's no surprise that the bass was up in the mix on all those Kinks records that Jim played on. Uh, the Kinks in the 80s, like I said, started with no budget, which is officially uh, 1989. There's your low budget album cover. Look at that. No inserts, nothing. No credits. Low budget, as the title implies. Dave guitar, Dave's guitar is front and center. It is a loose concept album about the economic hard times in the United States and the UK. It is very interesting to hear Ray comment on contemporary events rather than the nostalgia of Village Green and Arthur. Uh, this is de uh, decidedly a, uh, an arena rock album with a very punk British invasion flavor. Ian Gibbons is now on board on keyboards. 
Um, Gibbons created synth lines that support, supported Dave Davies' riffage. And, of course, Jim is a pocket guy that always supports the guitar player. So the Kinks now had this huge 80s sound. And in my opinion, this was the best the Kinks ever sounded, uh, starting with a, a low budget. Go back and check out the records, live videos. With Gibbons and Rockford, the Kinks were a bona fide arena rock band. Now, some people don't like arena rock bands, but it was the 80s. <laughs> bands played in arenas. Uh, the big hit was the disco tune, Superman. Interesting that rock artists were still contending with dance music dominating the airwaves. Uh, but people bought records that they heard on the radio. Excellent, excellent album tracks. The title track, Catch Me Now I'm Falling, Gallon of Gas, Little Bit of Emotion, Attitude. Low budget made for a great live show, hence the Kinks released uh, a live album, One for the Road in 1980, which was mostly low budget live with a few greatest hits sprinkled in just to remind folks how legendary the Kinks uh, are on stage, and as they were in the 60s and 70s. As Jim said to me in our interview, of all the bands he toured with in the early 60s, the Stones, the Who, the Beatles, the one band you did not want to follow was the Kinks. And even when the Beatles won an NME band competition, which featured a celebratory concert with all the nominated bands, the Beatles made sure the Kinks went on before them. So do check out that Kinks twofer. Uh, the first studio album was entitled Give the People What They Want. There's Ray running away from his graffiti on the wall. And that's exactly what the Kinks did. They gave the fans what they wanted. They gave the record company what they needed, which was a hit record. The standout tracks are Destroyer, Better Days, Around the Dial, Predictable with a hysterical MTV video, and the title track, all FM staples. Again, Ray is commenting on current events as he continues to do all through the 80s. He's still a romantic writer, introspective writer, but his focus is on the present rather than the past, which not only appealed to new audiences, myself included, but appealed to older Kinks fans. And now the Kinks are filling stadiums, Ray grows a beard, <laughs> and the band is a lean, mean, hard rock machine with an incredible repertoire. In June of 83, the Kinks release State of Confusion. Now there's all the guys running away from the wall, from Ray's graffiti on the wall. And again, it's another, it's another chart-topping record. It's sonically and aesthetically a continuation of Give the People, uh, really part two of that album. And the massive hit is Come Dancing with yet another classic video. And again, great album cuts, Bernadette and Don't Forget to Dance. Uh, Dave Davis is throwing in lots of classic Kinks riffs from past hits, so the Kinks are really firing on all cylinders. In November of 84, word of mouth appears, and to my ears, this is probably the best Kinks album uh, of the 1980s. It's also the last one to feature drummer Mick Avery as a full-time member. Of course, uh, long-standing tensions with Mick and Dave and Ray necessitated a change. However, he went to work in Conk Studios, which is what the, the studio the Kinks owned in London, so he was not skint. He was not... On the dull, as they say. Of course, you got to love those 80s graphics. Look at that hideous. Look at that. All the credits scrunched on the bottom. Great, great record. Do It Again was the big signal. Again, another great Kinks MTV video. Dave Davis even has a hit with Living on a Thin Line from that record. Uh, once again, supported by another big stadium tour. And the drummer is Bob Henrit, who plays on half that album and becomes the Kinks' permanent drummer. Uh, Bob was in Argent with Jim Rodford and was in bands who toured with the Kinks in the early 1960s. So the Kinks like to go for familiar faces when they replace their band members. Again, Big 80 sound filling stadiums. In November of 1986, the Kinks put out Think Visual. And this is where the formula starts to run a little bit thin. And you notice that Ray is the only band member pictured on the album. Uh, the band left Arista for MCA, and they really missed Arista's promotional machine. Uh, check out our notes from an artist interview with Mitchell Cohen, who worked at Arista Records, uh, that is on our podcast, and he can tell you more about that. But also, there's a new generation in place. Guns N' Roses, Van Halen, rule the hard rock world. You have pop stars to contend with in 86. Depeche Mode, Robert Palmer, Whitney Houston, Madonna, Peter Gabriel, George Michael, John Mellencamp, Tom Petty, among others, all put out career records in that time. Plus, you have the hair metal scene uh, dominating the landscape. Uh, plus, the British new metal was, was emerging with Def Leppard, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest. And the Kinks were starting to show their age. The modest hit on this album was Rock and Roll Cities with Dave Davis on lead vocals and Mick Avery 
returning on drums. I don't know how that worked out. And there's a good MTV video of that. But it, it, MTV really wasn't airing their videos in heavy rotation as they uh, did on the previous records. And I think it's, it's also Ray was still being a little bit more introspective and personal. And this was the 1980s go, go, go party all night. So uh, maybe, uh, you know, it really didn't fit the times. And Ray was definitely in a creative lull here. And with a song-driven band like the Kinks, that is not good. In 88, uh, the Kinks put out a live album with one new studio track, The Road. And this video made the Kinks look old. Lots of clips from the older versions of the band, and it almost seemed like a farewell video. However, in October of 1989, the Kinks released a killer album that somehow missed the charts. UK Jive, there it is. I think I got a promo copy of it. There it is. Factory Sealed for My Protection. Oh, I'm glad they did that. Um, this album was virtually ignored in the marketplace. I'm not even sure if it was released in the United States. But excellent tracks. The title cut, uh, How Do I Get Close to You, Down All the Days. Uh, the Kinks now toned down their arena sound. It was more of a pop veneer that you would expect from the Eurythmics, and it just did not work out for them. And that was the Kinks in the 1980s. They may not have lived up to their 60s and 70s classics in the songwriting sense, but they were still a force to be reckoned with. You know, it's nice to see a British Invasion band that still mattered in the 1980s and could play with the best of them. Again, Ray and Dave, just consummate performers. Uh, Jim Rodford, Ian Gibbons, Mick Avery and Bob Henry, just a, a, a tremendous rhythm section, a tremendous backing band. Those, that is really the best version of the Kinks, in my opinion. Of course, I'm not old enough to have seen them in the 60s. Uh, the word professional is, professionalism is often derided when talking about rock and roll, but the Kinks were pros, and, and they certainly played well, like it. Uh, their last album was Phobia in 93, and I know we're not defending the 90s, but this is another gem in the Kinks canon. It does suffer from the CD format of too many songs, because CDs are 80 minutes long, so this, al this album could have been split in two, and you'd have two excellent Kink records, but that's not what happened. Uh, that is my 1980s Kinks Chronicle. I think it was a very good decade for the Kinks. It was their, really their last decade together. Uh, I do not think they should reform. I think there is no reason to. They went out strong uh, with their last few releases, even though maybe they didn't do so well in the marketplace. My name is Tom Semioli. I approve of this message. I am defending the 80s and my base and my Steinberger XL base. Uh, let me know what you think. Be nice, be respectful, but don't be predictable. See you again on Notes from an Artist. <laughs>